Next, we delve into technology impact on patients and healthcare systems. Leading this discussion are Professor Ran Balitzel, Chief Innovation Officer at Klalit Health Services. Hi, there's a blinding light here, but uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, local people, of course, but I would like to especially extend our gratitude to the people who have traveled from abroad in these troubling times. This is exceedingly meaningful for each and every one of us and heartwarming that you have taken uh, the time, the effort, and uh, what is perceived as a risk in uh, spending time in this troubled area. This is very meaningful to us all. Thank you. Uh, I would, yes, I think all of our international guests, we could have a round of applause. So what I, I was asked to do today is to follow Noah that uh, I knew that she would present some of the, um, that side of the coin of uh, introducing technology and try to persuade you all, which is really difficult, that technology in healthcare is actually good. So um, I'd like to try and do that, and I hope I will have some success in this process. Um, but I will do this in a balanced way, and I will begin with the lighter side uh, of uh, the use of technology in healthcare, but I will, I will go to the other side as well. The basic point I want to make is that currently we are in a situation where we don't have much choice. There are conflicting uh, um, um, streams that are making our daily life worse and worse by the day. The population is getting older. Every age group is becoming sicker in average. The expectations of the public are all the time mounting. And the cost of technology, as we'll hear today, is continuously rising. When all of this is true, it meets on the other side a reduced number of healthcare professionals that are available per population and a reduced amount of funding in every healthcare system that's allocated for healthcare. This causes huge strain on the patients and their physicians and nurses and caregivers. So this does not, this cannot work. You know, you don't need to be an economist to understand that this thing is not sustainable. And basically, I would contend that the, our only hope for a sustainable healthcare system, and in Israel and in other countries as well, is to dramatically and imminently use AI and data in order to transform care. And basically, there are three streams I would like to suggest that are critical if we want to be able to do more with less. And these are moving from a reactive approach to a proactive approach, moving from an intuitive and error-prone medicine that we are currently providing every day to a more precise, more personal way of providing care that is actually effective and to take things which require manual labor and automate them. If we don't do these three things, our healthcare systems will fail. They will fail in Israel first, because we are the, one of the most parsimonious healthcare systems in the world, and then it will fail in the UK and in the United States and in the richest country, nevertheless. So I'll only have time today to give one example, so I'll talk about proactive and predictive care. And basically, at Clalit, we have believed for a long time that the way we should provide healthcare is not by patients coming into the clinic with their pain, but rather that we would call them and tell them, you know what, something is about to happen to you if you don't change your ways. Why don't you come into the clinic and we'll fix you up? And we've said this for almost two decades now. But in order to do this, you need to risk stratify your population. You need to understand who's at the highest risk and who's not. So you will not waste your few coins as we've said before, on the wrong things. You can't provide everything for everyone. You can't screen everyone, as Noah has justly mentioned. But in order to properly uh, risk stratify, you need to be able to predict who is going to be sick and who is not going to be sick. And for that, you need data. And for that, you need technology. And for that, you, need, you don't need AI. Actually, we've been doing this since 2010, when we put our first predictive model to predict who will have uh, renal insufficiency in a few years, and we've been able to do this with logistic regression 15 years ago. So you don't need AI, you just need the data and to know what you're doing. But I want to give a more recent example so you can understand. One of the diseases that I think is, is really worth discussing is hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is a liver disease that is the key cause of liver cancer and liver cirrhosis, which is exceedingly debilitating. We now have drugs, exceedingly effective drugs. 98, 99% effective drugs. 
as compared to a few years before, where they were only 50% effective. You get a patient with hepatitis C, you give him this drug, he's cured. He will not have levonorgestrel. He will not have liver cirrhosis. All you need is to find him in time, provide him the medication, and it's either in the basket of services, so it's free. The only problem is we don't know who has hepatitis C. In this room right now, there are hepatitis C carriers that are not aware of the fact that they are so. So we can't screen all of you. We don't have the money, nor the time, nor the physician, nor the nurses in order to do this. So what can we do differently? Well, maybe we should do something that has to do with prediction and AI and all of that stuff. So I want to give you one concrete example of something that we've done. We found out that every year we screen about 50,000 people to find hepatitis C cases. It's a rare disease in Israel. Therefore, we only find when we uh, go ahead and screen those 50,000 people, we find 38 positive cases. We give them the drugs, they're cured, everybody's happy. But at the end of the day, we want to do a little bit better than that. So what we have done is create a predictive model based on at least two different types of AI approaches, and we've tested them one against the other. At the end of the day, we found that three promils, the, the 3.3% of the population with the highest risk, and we went to them, we knocked on their door, and we said, would you like to come into the clinic and get tested because we think there's a high likelihood you might have hepatitis C and not know about it. And we've screened 500 such people. How many positive cases did we find? So this is basically a hundred-fold improvement in your screening capacity. Now, finally, you can go ahead and move ahead with the concept, with the theory of elimination of hepatitis C with a smart use of data in AI, which you could not do just one year before if you did not have that. So when, Noah, you were talking about, you know, maybe we need less technology and we need to be more judicious about the use, yes, we do, but we need to do this with technology in order to drive us the right way. Those of you who are interested in reading a little bit more about it, there's a paper from three weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine AI where we uh, uh, explain uh, some of the methodology and the outcomes of this approach. Um, but this is just one example. We've been doing this, as I said, for 15 years now. We have multiple, multiple different predictive models now in play, and they are all interjected into a single platform, the Clalit Predictive Proactive Intervention Platform called CPI, which is, I think, a globally unique system that allows you to not only identify the right patients at risk, but also to identify the care gaps that they have. And all of this is what is called explainable AI. So you don't just say the, to the physician, trust me, I'm the computer I know better. You can actually see the reason why that patient was de designed or, or uh, um, um, suggested to be at high risk and do something about it. So to give you just one example, every night to our 400,000 diabetic patients, about 9 million recommendations are spit out of the CPI platform into their electronic health records, trying to improve their care and to close their care gaps. This is not a theoretical construct. This is not something to publish in a paper. This is happening every day in 2,000 clinics around Clalit, and we've been doing it for a while, for years now. Just to show you the coin side, Noah, of this, when you introduce a prediction-based approach for multimorbid patients and you provide them with the right type of physician and nurse aid service, you don't, this is before, and this is a controlled study, and this is after. You have reduced your admissions by 43% by doing the, a combination of prediction and a physician and nurse-led approach to this in what we called LOTEM or Tipul Mechuvan, uh, which is a local approach that we have developed uh, with the help of Professor Efrat Chadmi from the uh, Haifa University and some friends from abroad, and we've been doing it for a while now. So, technology is great. Let's do as much as we can with it. Well, no. Um, Noah had a very just point in her uh, short presentation, and, and I want to touch for a second about the dark side of, of technology, and technology has a dark side. I could spend 50 minutes just talking about the dark sides, um, but I don't have time, so I'll just touch one example, and that is the problem of overdiagnosis. And overdiagnosis is a problem. These are the rates of a uh, really infectious disease called thyroid cancer. How do I know it's infectious? Because you can see how it is rising dramatically over a measure of 15 years. That has to be a, I mean, there's no chronic disease that could increase in such a pace, right? Well, no. This is just another chronic disease. So why 
do this disease go up in such levels? And how come that mortality hasn't changed a bit? Because this is an epidemic of overdiagnosis, not an epidemic truly. And that puts a huge burden. And basically, you can see that people are performing CTs in very different levels, and every one of these CTs has the potential of finding the wrong thing and bringing you in the wrong course of doing the wrong thing to the patient. And I can tell you that some of the studies suggest that for every thousand CT scans that you do, abdominal CT scans that you do, four kidneys go out. So, yes, overdiagnosis and overtreatment are very serious problems that we need to take care of. And a few years ago, in one of the conferences, I termed this as sensoritis, which the acute inflammation of the healthcare system when you overdiagnose and overput sensors that get the wrong signals and put the pa patients in harm's way. I'll also remind us that technology for years has put it out of the in touch of the patient. You can see a picture of a young girl in a physician's office shows that, you know, everybody's in the room and the physician is sitting like this, looking at the computer. Nobody came in to become a clerk and learn medicine in order to do this. Actually, now today, technology is helping us go away from this by creating listening, ambient listening in the physician's room and removing some of the keyboard work from what they're doing. So I want to finalize by telling you that by choosing technology, it's not about choosing risk versus no risk. When you make this choice, you actually need to decide whether you take technology or you take the status quo. And the status quo is bad. If you only take what happened after uh, the massacre of October 7 in terms of mental health, we do not have enough capacity, enough providers, enough uh, infrastructure in order to provide all the care that is required. So we created uh, questionnaires and we sent them proactively to large populations to find, again, in this approach of proactive approach, to find those that most need and provide them with care. We also sent this uh, uh, call for startups globally and locally, and we are now introducing a lot of new technology locally made and uh, uh, from the local vibrant ecosystem into uh, Clalit in order to redesign and restructure the healthcare system. And so you can see again and again that this is the only way forward. So to sum up, I think um, with the help of the people in this room, with the help of our friends from abroad, and uh, with the help of the vibrant local startup ecosystem, we can do so much better, and I hope that we will. Thank you.